Welcome to the Truth About False Confessions podcast. I'm Alan Hirsch, Chair of the Justice and Law Studies Program at Williams College and an expert on false confessions. To learn more, visit my website, truthaboutfalseconfessions.com. Now on to today's episode. John Doe, a 21-year-old man accused of clubbing a policeman senseless with a baseball bat in New York City and robbing the officer of his gun and handcuffs, was by all accounts a model citizen, a former altar boy with no criminal record. At his trial, Doe's priest testified as to his sterling character, which opened the door to evidence of bad character. The prosecution offered none. On the surface, though, the evidence against Doe was substantial. He was found wandering the streets of Queens at 1 a.m. in the vicinity of where a police officer had been assaulted and his handcuffs and gun taken. Police chased Doe down, and an officer claimed to see him drop the guns and handcuff. Another officer claimed that he asked Doe if he shot the cop, and Doe responded that he hit him with a baseball bat. It turned out the victim suffered severe head injuries caused by blunt force trauma. Questioned at the police station in an interrogation that was not recorded, Doe said he wanted the officer's gun in order to commit other robberies that would help him pay off a debt. He later recanted the confession, claiming it was literally beaten out of him by the cops. Even without the confession, the prosecution case was strong, if you considered the police witnesses trustworthy. The superb defense attorney, who I will call Dave Smith, did not. He believed that the police not only lied about what they saw, but also planted evidence. While there was a good deal of conflicting testimony about various matters, I felt the key to the case lay in a few pieces of evidence. First, the victim remembered that right before being clubbed, he stopped a car. Second and more important were the victim's gun and handcuffs. The prosecution maintained that the gun and handcuffs were in John Doe's possession when he was apprehended. If he did indeed possess the gun and handcuffs, the jury could and no doubt would find him guilty of robbery. That evidence would not prove that he assaulted the victim. Maybe someone else assaulted the victim, and Doe saw the prone officer in the aftermath of the assault and took his gun in handcuffs. In that case, he'd be guilty of robbery, but not assault. But suppose he did not have the officer's gun and handcuffs with him at any time. If that central part of the prosecution case was false, John Doe could not be found guilty of anything. And careful examination of the evidence suggests that John Doe never had possession of these items. Amidst numerous discrepancies in the testimony of the three officers who first saw John Doe, all agreed that only one of them saw the victim's gun and handcuffs in Doe's possession. The other two learned about the gun and handcuffs only when they saw them on the ground, not in anyone's possession. So in order to determine whether the gun and cuffs were ever in John's possession, the key was the third officer's testimony. He testified before the grand jury, just one month after the incident, that he saw the gun and handcuffs fall from John Doe's hand. But by the time he arrived on the scene, Doe's hands were held up in the air over his head and had been for some time. Before the grand jury, the assistant district attorney sought clarification. Do you know if it fell out of his hand or sleeve? And the officer took the opportunity to change his testimony. Sleeve, he said. But that merely replaced one absurdity with another. It's hard to imagine handcuffs fitting up someone's sleeves, and the officer said that they and the gun fell out simultaneously. Both of those items were in one sleeve? Perhaps he came to realize the absurdity of his own version of events, because when he testified at trial, the officer gave a third version, no less bizarre than the first two. He now said he didn't know where the gun and cuffs came from, but he saw them materialize into the air. He testified that the gun and cuffs crashed onto the concrete pavement, making a distinct sound that seized his attention. 
Yet neither of the other officers, just a few feet away, heard this sound. Guns and handcuffs don't come flying out of a sleeve or out of nowhere to be seen by one person out of three, and they don't crash to the pavement to make a loud noise heard by only one of three. Common sense suggests something fishy, and common sense was supported by science, specifically the forensic lab report in this case by New York City's chief medical examiner. The report said a DNA sample was collected from John Doe and various parts of the gun were tested. On each part, a mixture of two or more people was indicated. In each case, the report said John Doe was excluded. Put this all together, and the conclusion was, if not inescapable, at least compelling. The gun and handcuffs were never in John Doe's possession. They were planted on the scene by one of the officers. I don't make such a suggestion lightly, but these were not ordinary circumstances. The officers had just heard that their fellow officer was assaulted, left bloody and unconscious. It is understandable if they acted irrationally. The jury heard a recording of the officers radioing for assistance. They were badly shaken, as anyone in their shoes would be. And when they believed they had captured the person who severely wounded one of their own, you can imagine what they were feeling. Could that lead them to manipulate evidence? I can't say for sure. But I do know that all the evidence amassed by law enforcement involved weird improbabilities or even impossibilities. The gun, the handcuffs, and as we shall see, the baseball bat. And none of these items were linked by DNA or fingerprints to John Doe. Of course, the defense did not have the burden of proving who did assault the officer. That said, the trial provided a good idea who might have one of the occupants of the automobile he approached just before he was struck. That made more sense than the idea of John Doe as the culprit. First, the car was positively identified as present at the time the officer was struck. The link between John Doe and the crime scene was far weaker. From a block away, in darkness, an officer saw someone in the aftermath of the crime whom he later determined to be John Doe based on his dark clothing. Second, the occupants of the car approached by the officer may have had a motive to assault him. We have no idea what was in their vehicle or what they had been doing, but it's not hard to imagine that they didn't want the police to find out. And they apparently sped away after he was struck. By contrast, John Doe had no plausible motive to commit this crime, and he had no history of violence. Finally, as noted, A DNA sample taken from John Doe did not match DNA on anything at the crime scene. The occupants of the car, by contrast, were never tested. The prosecution theory of the case involved a nice kid of normal intelligence and no history of violence assaulting a police officer for the purpose of taking his gun in order to commit more robberies, of all ways to get a gun. Even if John Doe was crazy enough to do that, Would he do so with eyewitnesses present and headlights shining? In his confession, John Doe said the motive for the crime was erasing a debt of roughly $15,000. One might expect such a debt to leave a paper trail, or at least some sort of trail. In fact, the evidence presented at trial concerning John's finances refuted the suggestions of a debt. The prosecution theory of the case required John Doe racing through the streets carrying a gun, a large bag, handcuffs, and a baseball bat. I'm not sure that's even possible, but that's what one of the officers claimed to see. At trial, he was the closest thing to an eyewitness. Direct evidence called into question his credibility. This officer acknowledged changing terms on vouchers and making inaccurate statements under oath. Not about minor details but crucial facts like which hand the suspect used to extract the victim's gun and whether he observed the person he chased from the scene discard a baseball bat. When several facts like that get changed, it's usually because a story isn't adding up. One of the officers testified that he found the presumed crime weapon, a baseball bat, when he went looking for his hat that had flown off his head. He found them side by side in the street. Do you go looking for your hat in the middle of the night after you've just chased and apprehended someone you believed bludgeoned your fellow cop? The officer claims he not only went looking for his hat, but miraculously found it lying right next to the alleged crime weapon, the bat. 
Besides the dubious evidence concerning the bat handcuffs and gun, the only evidence against Doe was his videotaped confession and a self-damning statement he allegedly made to yet another policeman. This officer testified that he asked Doe whether he shot the victim, and Doe responded, no, I hit him with a baseball bat. This testimony was key. As we will see, there were many reasons not to believe Doe's confession. It took place after he spent hours in the middle of the night at the police station undergoing God knows what kind of treatment. It contradicted common sense and was refuted by direct evidence. I'll get to that. But on the surface, Doe's statement to the officer was different. The officer testified that before Doe was interrogated, before he spent hours in the bowels of the police station without food and sleep, before all that, he said he clubbed the victim with a bat. But this officer's story was even stranger than his colleague's tale of flying handcuffs. This officer acted the way one might expect of someone who had just heard that one of his officers had been beaten senseless. He showed compassion, tending to his colleague and making sure assistance was on the way. Before long, though, he sought out the man police had apprehended. One can imagine that he wanted to get at that person he believed had harmed his colleague. Perhaps he wasn't going to let someone get away with that. The officer testified that he went to see Doe solely to obtain information that might assist the treatment of the victim. But by the time he got to Doe, the victim was already in a hospital receiving state-of-the-art care from professionals who would determine the nature of his wound without third-hand information. Also, the officer admitted that at the time he instructed his underlings to hold Doe so he could talk to him, he had no reason to doubt his assessment of a gunshot wound. He testified that the precise nature of the wound could differ depending on the caliber of gun, but he never asked Doe about that. All he asked was whether Doe shot the victim. The idea that he was looking for information to assist medical treatment defies credulity. And if we can't believe his reason for going to see Doe, can we believe his account of what was said? If all of the above doesn't raise doubts, the officer's story was highly curious on its face. He alleged that he approached John Doe and basically said, Hey, fella, did you shoot my officer? And with no prompting, just a polite question, Doe said, Nah, I used a baseball bat. Defense counsel Dave Smith argued that the officer jumped on John Doe before he got to the police station for a reason. That is the time, before the suspect clams up and asks for a lawyer, to procure a confession. That was the time to rough Doe up or put words in his mouth. And since he saw a baseball bat in the vicinity, he knew just what words to put in his mouth. The officer's conflicting testimony could not be the basis for finding guilt beyond reasonable doubt. But what about the defendant's own words? The jury saw his confession with their own eyes. But to me, the confession was not convincing at all. Let's start with what John Doe did not say. He made no mention of the victim approaching a car just before he struck him. He made no mention of a car at all. This is significant because it provides a clue about where Doe got the information in his confession. At the time of the confession, the police had no idea about the car. The victim was unconscious when they got to him, then taken to the hospital. He couldn't tell them about the car. Virtually everything in John Doe's confession was already known to the authorities. They knew about the handcuffs, the gun, the bag, and the bat. So when Doe talked about these items, he could easily have been spitting back what he'd heard. But when it came to something the officers did not know about, the car that the victim approached, John Doe didn't say a word. There were a few pieces of information Doe supplied in his confession that the authorities did not already have, most notably his debt of $15,000, his alleged motive for the assault. That claim enabled them to test the truth of this confession, and they found zero evidence to support it. Did John Doe fabricate his debt to supply a motive for a crime he didn't commit? Throughout the confession, he grew hesitant whenever asked about motive. He mentioned vague family troubles, then a vague debt, later a vague plan to commit a robbery. The alleged debt presented a fact the police should have investigated to confirm the reliability of the confession yet they testified that they did not. Why bother? They admitted that they assumed John Doe was guilty from the beginning. 
when the presumption of guilt leads you to fail even to attempt to verify a confession, you're not doing your job. Critically, there was a piece of new information in the confession that turned out to be false. John Doe claimed that he struck the victim twice. The cops couldn't have fed him that information because they had no idea how many times the victim was struck. Perhaps faced with a question to which he hadn't been fed an answer, John Doe had to guess and guessed wrong. Defense attorney Smith cross-examined the lead detective about questions the cops failed to ask John Doe during his confession. At the top of the list, they failed to ask an obvious follow-up about his debt. To whom did you owe $15,000? They also failed to probe why in the world Doe thought that assaulting a police officer was the best way to obtain a gun. Of course, for jurors, there was a big hump to get over. The one nagging question they were sure to ask. Why would John Doe confess to a terrible crime he did not commit? The answer starts with what we did not see. The four hours in the middle of the night in the police station. All we saw was the final 15 minutes of that ordeal. We don't know what happened during the preceding hours or during the period before John Doe was apprehended and hauled to the station. What we do know is the circumstances amounted to a perfect storm for a false confession. The police were reacting to one of their own, bloodied and battered and left in the street. They quickly apprehended the person they thought was the perpetrator, but who may have been the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time. The officers didn't know about the car the victim approached just before he was struck. When they looked around, they saw John Doe. They thought he had brutalized their fellow officer. Should it surprise us if they went to some lengths to get Doe to admit guilt? Perhaps manipulating evidence and telling untruths? Would it shock us if they roughed Doe up? Wouldn't it be more surprising if they didn't get rough when he maintained his innocence? Experience teaches that officers do not act dispassionately in a situation like this. And a 21-year-old kid with no experience with the criminal justice system, hungry and exhausted and scared out of his mind, confronted with furious policemen intent on breaking him down, might at some point give in. The officers denied that they got rough with John Doe. The lead detective denied that they even interrogated him. They just left him alone for a few hours, poked their head in, and asked if he cared to talk, and lo and behold, Doe spilled his guts. Let's assume for a minute this is true. What would it say if police tossed a 21-year-old into a cell for several hours in the middle of the night handcuffed, no food, no water, no bathroom? If that's how they treated John Doe, who knows what they did before and after? While the lead detective's own admission of how they treated a person presumed innocent is bad enough, I question whether he told the whole truth. His story is as improbable as his fellow officer's story of Doe's earlier confession to him, and these two improbable stories actually collide. They can't both be true. The first officer said Doe confessed to him before they even got to the station something he surely would have immediately passed along to the lead detective. If Doe had already confessed, why did the lead detective squirrel him away for hours rather than immediately ask him to make out a sworn statement and repeat his confession in front of the camera? Why give him hours to change his mind and change his story or decide he wants a lawyer? I question whether either officer was telling the truth. Both would have us believe that John Doe was a first-time criminal for some reason eager to spend his life behind bars. Just ask him nicely, and he'll tell you he smashed a cop's skull with a baseball bat. I rather doubt that they asked Doe anything nicely. We don't know for sure because they turned on the camera only at the end of his four hours in the station, only when he finally said he'd give them what they wanted, a confession. Of course, jurors didn't see the police mistreat John Doe. They didn't see much of anything, just the final 15 minutes of a four-hour ordeal at the police station. Something else they didn't see was any physical evidence linking Doe to this crime. Could the confession alone prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? A middle-of-the-night recitation from a 21-year-old no doubt scared for his life and at the mercy of a half-dozen police officers likely hell-bent on revenge? One other nagging question might have been on jurors' minds. Another hump to get over before they could acquit. What was John Doe doing on the street at 1 a.m.? 
Maybe wrong place at the wrong time will strike some as too convenient, but that strikes me as a mistake. Queens is a big borough. On any given night, some people wander, maybe for fresh air or to meet someone, maybe for a smoke or because they are night owls. It's no great coincidence that someone would be walking the streets after midnight when a crime was committed because people walk the streets at all hours. The victim and his partners were patrolling the street for a reason. Life doesn't stop at midnight, not in New York City. So it's no great surprise that when the police looked around after an assault, they found someone nearby. That would have been more revealing if they found someone with a history of violence or a rational motive for this crime. They did not. There is no law against being out late. Someone who takes a stroll or visits friends or is on the street for any of a thousand reasons should not become a suspect whenever a crime occurs nearby. Despite all of the above, I worried about a guilty verdict. Jurors find it hard to accept the innocence of someone they've seen on a screen confess. But a confession is just words. Guilt beyond reasonable doubt should require more. People say things that are false, even against their self-interest, all the time. By contrast, DNA doesn't lie. Why wasn't John Doe's DNA at the crime scene or on the presumed weapon? Why was he excluded as a donor to the gun he allegedly stole from the crime? The jurors deliberated for four days before coming back with a mixed result. They acquitted John Doe of attempted murder. They deadlocked 6-6 on assault and robbery, resulting in a hung jury on those charges. They convicted John Doe of one charge only, criminal possession of a weapon, a relatively minor offense that nonetheless carried a sentencing range of three and a half to 15 years. I disagree with the verdict for reasons that should be apparent, but I do not wish to come down hard on this jury. They deliberated at impressive length, and the six jurors who held out for acquittal on all but the possession charge deserve praise. Given the tendency of jurors to believe even the flimsiest confessions, these six jurors acquitted themselves well, so to speak. The main source of injustice in this case was not the jury, but the judge. The judge, who saw the same evidence as the jury, sentenced John Doe to the maximum 15 years. For a first-time offender to receive the maximum sentence was outrageous. It surely reflected the fact that the judge, unlike six of the jurors, assumed Doe's confession to be true and punished him less for the possession charge than the more serious charges for which the jury acquitted or hung. The judge all but admitted as much, stating at sentencing that this is not a simple possession case. While I cannot be sure of John Doe's innocence, I feel strongly that the verdict of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, even on the single charge, was unjustified, and I am 100% sure that the 15-year sentence for criminal possession was unjust. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Truth About False Confessions podcast. I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whichever platform you used to listen.